Who am I? I'm here to speak about myself, and as such, I humbly ask that you afford me the chance to render this short soliloquy in a style that is entirely my own. If it isn't your cup of tea, I welcome you to take solace in the fact that you need not suffer through it any longer than the next three to four minutes. Allow me to tell you a little bit about the man that stands before you. I am the lowest common denomination of a millennial generation, the antecedent to a regent pantomime, a totalitarian paradigm, earnestly urging an emerging proletariat class to mask their tacit last lack of a lasting grasp on an ass-backwards economy, wrapped in a taxonomy fashioned from an obtuse ontology, bleated via Alan's green-speaked false prophecies and the proffered mockery of Ben Bernanke's hanky-panky. I am the lens that cleanses the vision of a society trying to live without division, quietly living in piety, silently willing a mission of peace into fruition, vying to climb whatever ladder it takes to ascend to a place where it's possible to make the slightest trace of a difference on earth. Just like Mom always said I would, because I'm special. Trusting I'm honest and spreading good, becoming a vessel for whatever divine conscious I find on my climb until the time I arrive at the place he has defined for me long ago, or so I've been told every day since I was about two years old. I am an anonymous celebrity of uncompromising integrity, unconsciously leveling revolutionary ideas into stark relief with mass beliefs sparked by a marked departure from mainstream ideology. The metaphorical pain cream relieving the tension dispensed when fence is self erected between a self-elected semi-fascist ruling class tasked with amassing cash and the disillusioned masses asking for anything that passes for the slightest splash of satisfaction. I have tried to define my very existence by subsisting on a diet of persistent resistance to calcification, by relying on my powers of observation, by, and by vowing to fill every hour of this rat race, not pacing aimlessly, nor chasing gamelessly some unattainable goal, because while painful, I know that I was born into a role. And though my sole raison d'etre claims to stretch the boundaries of possibility, it remains attainable in its scope, or at least I hope, maybe I can change the world. And so my story unfurls. I was born a bastard, truly in every sense of the word by definition. <laughs> my defense as a newborn's innocence is conferred by tradition. And yet I contend that since then I've earned the right to the title and condition <laughs> via commission of access edition by casting suspicion on society's patricians, but with full cognition of my position and mission of my own volition and without contrition. And I was but a lad when I lost my dad at the tender age of eight. I remember the way I waited at the door when he left his maybe... The sore throat, tight chest, and torn heartbreak that I was too young to express might only be a test, and if I was patient, perhaps he'd return. Alas, I, would had, I still had so much to learn. And those weren't the last of my tears that I'd shed for the father who never bothered to stay much more than two years. And for the longest time, I struggled in social situations. I wasn't the strongest, finding juggling hopeful aspirations of the promise of my emotional actualization with the woeful realization that most of my obligations of educational preparations would take precedence over the appropriation of my peers' admiration. The result of this was an inundation of perturbations, irritations, complications, simple conversations led to altercations and confrontations. Without provocation, explanation, or anticipation, it became my motivation that the appreciation and greater valuation of the accumulation of information above that of strengthening my communication skills and the restoration of my reputation among my school's population. I took solace in the arts in pursuit of flawless marks in class, asking every question, passing every test, and grasping the lessons my teachers imparted, hardly knowing my period of disillusionment had only but started. By age 18, I had visited Shakespeare's birthplace in Stonehenge. I had chased my dreams with inquisitive haste, fearing nothing. I had climbed the Eiffel Tower. My flight to Australia, a tale I'll tell you later, took place over 24 hours. I had met plenty of world powers in the quest for my cause, among them Michael Dell and the CEO of Intel, and Steve Woz, Kevin Mitnick, the world's most notorious hacker, had captured my identity before an audience of over 2,000 computer conference geeks, which forced me to then password protect my accounts to prevent any leaks. <laughs> when I look back, I think it's surprising to surmise how in the blink of an eye, I had accomplished these things even before turning the age where I became legally old enough to order a drink. I've been a bare-knuckle boxer in over a hundred fights, a prince and a pauper, a villain, white knight and the like, and for much of my life, just a nobody. My hobby was parties in college, and my demons were many, for while I'd done plenty, I couldn't throttle my love for the bottle. Until lately, when the, when the weight seemed somehow innately easier to bear, and I swear to all of you this, 
All of that's over because as of this week, I'm celebrating the anniversary of two years now. Sober. That's one step closer to unshouldering that boulder. I certainly don't miss the hangovers, and while I'm happy to say, while I surely hope these disclosures won't appear as overexposure in the eye of the beholder, it's also over two years that I've been a non-smoker. <laughs> so in closure, my name is Michael Sean McDade, but you can call me Crates. My whole life and so on is laid out, everything in its place. For the sake of working it in, I'll add that I have nothing to rescind. <laughs> so nice. if you like it, that's great. But if not, at any rate, you'll be elated to know that I've stated my case, and I'm done. So don't hate. Adversity causes some men to break. Others to break records. William Arthur Ward. I find myself often consumed with a sense of absolute wonderment and appreciation for where I am standing right now. I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to me to be here, working at Gardner, speaking with all of you. The path that I've taken has not been an easy one. They say that to reach enlightenment, some will go up a very steep slope that is almost impossible to climb. Others will go up a very small incline over the course of infinite lifetimes. I feel like my journey over the last few years has been very much like that steep slope, that climb from where I was to where I am today. I think that if any of you knew me several years ago, as little as three years ago, you probably wouldn't recognize me at all. The reason being, that three years ago, almost to the exact day, I made a commitment to sobriety that completely changed the course of my life. Only a few months prior, I had been told by my doctor that I had signs of early onset cirrhosis. At 26 years old, I had already begun to drink myself to death. It was clear to me at that time that I needed to make a change, a significant lifestyle change, all pervasive, to translate the failures I had had in the past into success. That was easily the most difficult thing I've ever done. <coughs> I don't feel it's appropriate to go into all of the details associated with the physical maladies involved in the detox process. I will tell you that more people die each year from alcohol detox than from any other drug in the world, including crack cocaine and heroin. It's a physically difficult process involving fever, shakes, chills, sleeplessness, and in my case, for the very first time in my entire life, thoughts of suicide. In February of 2011, I quit smoking. That, for me, was like a test case, an opportunity to show myself that I can kick a habit of seven years prior, that I have the willpower and discipline to move forward with my life. I succeeded in that. And so two months later, in April of 2011, I began the process of becoming sober, something that I did largely on my own. I had done support groups in the past, and I felt compelled to make this a struggle that I was solely responsible for. My success or failure rode solely on my shoulders. One of the people I take great inspiration from, and one of my best friends in the world right now, is a man with a tremendous success story behind him. Someone that I've seen as a mentor for some time now, who has managed to accomplish things that I hope in my life someday accomplish. <clears throat> this is a man who has 
been interviewed on television, talk shows, for the changes and impact he's had in his local community. He has single-handedly, personally raised more money than any other organization in the world for charities sponsored by Stop and Shop. To clarify, this is a man who works for the Stop and Shop company, raising money out in front, taking donations locally only, and has raised more money than Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Club, and any other organization that Salvation Army that stands outside in front of Stop and Shop and asks for money around the holidays. Millions and millions of dollars, all from his local community. For absolutely no reason other than the fact that he wants his day-to-day -day existence to mean something. He chooses to make his life, every ounce of it, count. That man's name is Joe Campuchero. I'm inspired by his actions, I'm, I'm inspired by his success. And I would be under any circumstances. But especially so because Joe has one of the most severe cases of Down syndrome I've ever seen. It's part of what shows me that any kind of adverse adversity can be overcome, that any person can make every moment of their lives truly count and have an impact not only for the benefit of themselves, but those around them. <clears throat> when I finally came out of the other side of a very long time <coughs> with alcoholism, I decided to find opportunities in my own life to give back. I've always been a fan of supporting your local community, volunteering in organizations that have personal significance to you. I was a volunteer at the Hole in Wall Theater of New Britain for four years, served on the board for a year. I've actually served on the board of five nonprofit organizations in my life so far. These contributions are very small but meaningful to the people that they affect, to the local communities in which I've had an opportunity to make them. For me, volunteering at the Hole in Wall Theater had more to do with personal relationships than with any personal gain. You see, when I was in the eighth grade, <clears throat> I was tremendously shy, a different kind of adversity in my life. I had very little ability to communicate with anybody. That, in my eyes, prevented me from getting to take advantage of opportunities in my life. But I had absolutely no idea how to overcome it. There was no Toastmasters group for me, no opportunities to connect in ways that forced me to stretch my comfort zone. I became very thankful for all of those reasons to my social studies teacher at the time, John Verchion, who had been a co-founding member of that very theater, the whole world. He saw that in our class we had gotten past the level of required material at that point in our curriculum, months ahead in fact. And so he offered us an opportunity to take the additional time we had, the lead time we had over the other classes, and do a production of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Being the most shy student in his class, he chose to cast me in the lead role as Ebenezer's group. <laughs> that was not easy for me either. <coughs> As a result of that experience, for the very first time in my life, I found myself coming out of my shell, beginning to engage with my peers, engage with an audience, and feel the respect and commitment required and associated with a role like that. So years later, when I happened to attend a production of a detective story at the Hole in the Wall Theater, not knowing that it had anything to do with my formal, former social studies teacher. I was amazed to see his name as the co-director and disappointed to find out that while I was attending on closing night, and he was a significant member of the production being, a, being the co-director, that he couldn't attend that night because 
his cancer was getting to a point where he couldn't get out of the house. I had an opportunity since then as a result of volunteering with that theater in an effort to make a renewed connection with my childhood mentor to say my thank yous and my goodbyes to someone who truly changed my life. And in volunteering in that organization, I felt like I had an opportunity to continue to pay those favors forward to other people who had struggled with being able to connect with others. I greatly miss and remember John Berrettini fondly to this day. The lesson that he taught me went beyond even being shy or connecting with other people. He taught me to give freely of myself as much as I can, even when I feel stressed, even when I feel overworked, to set aside some of my time to do for others. And for that, I'm immensely grateful. And I encourage everyone here to find that unique opportunity in your own lives. There's nothing else like it in the world. Thank you.